Welcome guys, it's good to see you. Hope everybody had a good weekend. We're uh, in the middle of September in gear now in the semester. Hope all your classes are going well. I think we got off to a great start in this class. In the summertime by this time around and we were halfway through this advanced accounting class. So I feel like we're in slow motion a little bit and I love it because it's too fast to do this class in a month. I think it's just too much material. So I'm happy that we have four months. So I know you guys, some of you guys, a lot of recruiting events right now. I know a lot of campus events. I see, I'm hearing a lot of buzz, exciting, a lot of exciting stuff. I know a lot of stuff happened last week. Some of you guys went to MetLife yesterday, first time at Rutgers. How was that? Did you guys like that? I heard they're doing um, a case competition that they decided to do. Somebody just told me in the elevator. So that would be exciting to do. And I was just thinking back a little bit about when I was on campus interviewing with the big four. I remember interviewing with Deloitte around this time around, back, in, back then. And um, I just remember trying to prepare for those interviews. And it was sort of, I remember it was being really confusing because they said, they always said they're not going to be technical. So they said, don't worry about the accounting. Just like know more things about the firm or, you know, be personable and like ask good questions. Ask good questions. So, I, you know, I try to listen to that advice. I, you know, study Deloitte website. You go on the Deloitte website. It's like so much is going on. It's like, it looks like a, like a PR firm or something, like a TV production firm or something. It looks like, what are these guys doing? Like, um, but I think the idea, I remember, I remember some of the things that were positive in my interviews was when I took like a genuine interest in the company. For example, if, um, I'm trying to remember what I talked about, but at the time I think it was like um, 2005, and I think FASB 157 was like a big thing where fair value valuation was just coming out back then in the legislation. So I, I think I asked questions about, I actually studied a little bit around that, and I just asked how that's impacting the firm. And I just remember getting a couple of hits with those people. I remember there's a lot of them, interviewers. But I remember like just like getting them to, to really engaging them. Like, oh, yeah, we're going through that, and it's a big firm initiative right now. And then and hit them with another one. Oh, what about your client? You had that big client, and... And that was going on, and you guys seemed to change your books around, and there was a filing with the SEC. You know, they just want to make sure that you, 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 know, you actually studied the website. Because if you studied the website, it sounds like you're interested in the firm. You know, their biggest look is to see if you're, if you're interested or not. Why? Because, you know, I was on the interviewer side also a little bit in the, in the firms and in the hedge fund. And I noticed, you know, my biggest look was always like, oh, are they interested in the job? Because I don't know. They seem smart. Like, is this a smart person? Like, the resume, I already know they're smart. That's not an issue. The issue is, do they want to do this stuff? And that's always the question of those people. Because they want to make sure that you, you are sure that you want to do it. Because you're smart. Because you're, already, you're smart because you're there. They're not going to assess whether you're smart or not. So it's an interesting thing because if you show that you're interested, you actually get, you know, that's how I found that you make the best impression. That's why asking good questions usually is the gateway to some of that, from my experience, you know? So just something from past experience. So what I wanted to do today, guys, I wanted to go over um, today, chapter two, by reviewing some of the stuff, sort of solidifying the technical aspects of what we studied last time. And then I wanted to do a quick group project for you guys, which I drew up over here. Um, five minutes of group work, when you work on answering questions and presenting them back to me. And then I wanted to go over the homework go over through the word file question by question resolve what's going on resolve your questions show you guys some of the answers and then 15 20 minutes i wanted to introduce chapter three 
introduce the packet that I hand out to you and, and go over basically the plan for Thursday, which is going to be pretty much a pure study of chapter three, just like a lecture. Okay? So I was going over, I was going over the data for chapter three for this week's, for this week's lecture plan, and I realized that even when I'm doing these consolidations over and over again, and I'm starting to realize like the, you know, the mechanics of the consolidation, it's really hard to understand still the fundamentals of why we're doing it, who we're doing it with, and what we're doing before actually doing it. So I wanted to backtrack a little bit one more time and just go over with you guys one more time of what is going on here. So if the solution occurs, I think we nailed that in our example. If the solution occurs, then all we're doing, we're saying we're going to bring the assets over one time onto the balance sheet, remove the other company completely, and then basically, we're done with the consolidation, right? Now, if the solution doesn't occur in a way, and if, you know, if the solution does occur, we still have to go through the process of evaluating how much goodwill there was, right? We still have to do that. Still have to do that. So, now, if the solution does occur, if the solution does occur, what, what is our job in a way? What do we have to, there's a sort of, I just want to go over the steps one more time. Like, what is our job in terms of figuring out from, from start to finish of what is our task? What is our goal in a way? Like when it, when does consolidation actually occur? If the solution doesn't take place, if the two companies remain se separate, ongoing. Yeah, exactly, Ruby. So you're getting ready to prepare the finan financials, then you you put in the consolidation entries. But on the date of consolidation, on the date of the purchase, what takes place? If the solution doesn't occur. That happens if the solution does occur. If you record, so that's the idea, if you record it as an investment, so you record it as an investment when you purchase it, right? What else happens? On the date of acquisition, what else happens? So you have an investment, that's good. What else might happen? You have a purchase price, right? Mark up your assets to the fair values, the patents and things, exactly. You mark up. Now, this markup is not going to be recorded on the books of records of the parent or the subsidiary. I think this is where it's hard to grasp it because we're going to record the fact that there was a markup but we're not going to actually mark it up, right? All we're going to do is going to record this, all these things in the investment account. Now, how is the markup going to affect us? That's another step. So one is going to determine if there's goodwill. So that's another goal. On the date of acquisition, we need to re determine if and what is the goodwill amount. Right? So, so again, so you kind of, on the date of acquisition, the solution doesn't take place. What do you do? You're like, okay, I have a purchase price. That's going to be the investment amount. Right? The investment amount, right, is going to also reflect markup of fair value of assets. So, so that's going to throw off future amortizations. And these amortizations are going to come up when? End of the year. End of the year. So, kind of, if you're trying to, if you're really trying to conceptualize what's going on here, 
you create, there was a transaction that threw off future transactions. So that's sort of the, the, the step that we're going through. The future transaction is going to come around at year end, right? That's part of it. So so we have goodwill, we have markup of assets, we have future amortizations. Um, now, all of this stuff is happening. Why? Who can tell me why? What are we trying to do at year end? Now, the investment account, is it still going to exist at year end? It's going to get consolidated at year end, right? So that's, that's kind of what we're talking about, where it starts getting very complicated, I feel like. If you don't, especially if we're not uh, cool with the basics. So if the so you have an investment account and then I'm also saying it like I'm going to eliminate it at year end. I'm going to eliminate the investment account at year end. So I thought about it this, this weekend, this week. In a, in a way, you guys are comfortable with the dissolution case study where you bring over the assets of the company and liquidate it, right? Who's comfortable with that? Pretty comfortable with that? So now, what if I told you, in a way, you do the solution at year end every year if you don't do the solution on the date of acquisition. In a way, you perform dissolution, a dissolution-like procedure at the end of the year. So now, what, do you, so what does that mean? That means that you have to bring over the assets. So when you bring over the assets, that's when you use, for example, the journal entry A and S. That is your dissolution entry. That is your dissolution entry. Because what you're doing is, one by one, bringing over the assets. And what are you dissolving? Your investment account. Your investment account is what you used to record your relationship to the subsidiary. So you're like, I own this company. I have an investment in it. True. To what degree? Whatever, 900,000. Now, what is an investment in a company re really represent? What does the investment in a company really represent? Percentage shares, or in reality, only 100% in this case, in reality, if I was to value it, if I was going to zoom in a little bit more, what am I really owning? The fair value of the assets. Just purchase them, so it's fair value, and it's assets, less liabilities. So it's the fair, or we could say the fair value of the equity. It's the fair value, investments are the fair value of the assets minus liabilities of the underlying company, a.k.a. equity, fair value of equity. So you have the fair value of assets minus liabilities of another company on your book. And you're calling that an asset, you're naming it investment. Now, what is this asset actually made of? It's made of the assets and liabilities on the subsidiary's balance sheet. So all consolidation entry does is it says, listen, it's fine. We had the investment. In for, you know, we had it nice and clean. We called it investment. It's fine. We called it investment. It was really easy to see. It was really easy to keep track of. In fact, we knew how much profit loss it's generating. On the balance sheet, it looked like it was growing or coming down. So I liked seeing it as an investment. But now it's your end, and we all know that it's not an investment. It's actually part of your company. So we need to bring over the underlying assets and liabilities. So journal entry A 
does that, which is the same as the dissolution journal entry we, we looked at the Rutgers PowerPoint last week. Now, so what is the job of journal entry A? Who can explain to me? You know, and that is journal entry A. That is journal entry A. And the purpose of journal entry A, as John said, is to perform the solution, essentially, and mark up the assets that you own on the subsidiary side on the parent side. How do you do that? You basically bring this over, and you add it to here. You add it across to get the correct balance. I know you guys were reading this book all weekend. Well, it was really nice out, <laughs> especially before bed. Instead, instead of taking Tylenol PM, it's very effective to look at consolidation worksheets before bed. By the way, like 10:45 to 11:15, if you're restless, page 350. Um, so what does it do? Eventually, this is the consolidated column of numbers. All you did was you brought, you basically added the assets of the subsidiary onto the parent's book via A. And on the credit side, you eliminated the investment. Now, for bonus points, something doesn't add up here. Who's, who is here who wants to be an accountant? Something doesn't add up here, no? What's, because the investment account is 2620, and the uh, elimination is only 2020. So who, what's the difference? So it's 600, yeah. So what does the 600 represent, Carlos? It's the remaining investment in small pork company, which represents the stock. The stock. And what does the stock represent, like in a way, what is the stock? What is the stock? It's the equity, it's the equity of the subsidiary. And what's interesting about equity of the subsidiary is interesting is because you're eliminating the book value of the subsidiary. And the book value of the subsidiary is 600. Why is it 600, guys? Because that was the assets minus liabilities of the subsidiary at the time of purchase, right? So A is only there to mark up assets beyond their book value to the degree of their fair value, as opposed to S is there to eliminate the book value of the subsidiary, right, which is only 600. How do you know the book value of the subsidiary is 600? There's two ways, no? What are the two ways to know that they're double checking? To double check? Yeah. You could look at the equity, which I just did. You could look at the equity, which I just did. Exactly. Thank you. And what's the other one? Your pay, well, your payment was more, though. Your payment was 2620. How do you know the book value of the subsidiary is 600? Is there another way to double check? Yeah, serious? Exactly. When in doubt, it's always that. You could always say that. So 600, right? Because you have 800 minus 200 is 600. So to, you know, so to the degree that you wanted to eliminate the equity, you did because that's your 600 here, and it matches your 600 here, right? And this is your 220 is comprised of this, 2020 I mean, and that matches up to this. So that's kind of the balancing 
of this journal entry and how you work with it is to understand the mechanics of what, when, where more, a little bit more now than the actual numbers because the mechanics of what, where, what, what, where, how here is a lot more important to understand what's going on. And going back to what you said, the, the purpose of this is to come up with these numbers. These are the numbers that we want. And what are these numbers? This is the parents audited financial that it gets published to the world at year end. SEC filing. The subsidiary books is something that the subsidiary keeps track of within their own internal accounting world. Right? Could quite possibly be there's also a public company somewhere in Africa or something. Who knows? And they're doing another filing on another exchange. So who knows? It could be. The parents' books, same thing. Could be a public, you know, public company with its own report doing its own thing. And they're basically required to consolidate because of their 100% ownership percentage. So they're required to publish such numbers. But the question is, do they want to commingle books? They do not. They do not want to commingle their books. They're separate entities. They have separate lives, they have separate purposes. They don't want to commingle their books. So in order to resolve this desire not to commingle books, we perform these very weird transactions at your end. And we sort of do it as like a sort of the surgery, manually come in, touch everything up, come up with the numbers, publish the report, and then deconsolidate, right? Do we not, do we consolidate and then we deconsolidate? That's the idea. And if you look at chapter 3 in your packet, they do this consolidation, deconsolidation for three years. His head starts spinning. He's like, what are you doing? Like, I want this thing to be done. And they're like, no. We're going to consolidate and we're going to deconsolidate. We're going to consolidate and we're going to deconsolidate. And you're going to keep track of all the accounts separately and then together and then separately and then together. But that could take like a whole book just to do that example. I don't, you know, they just kind of want you to fast forward through it and understand it. So that's why I want you guys to sort of understand a little bit better. This is the parent, this is the subsidiary. They're keeping separate books. Once a year they perform these transactions and then they go back to the way their own books are. So with this in mind, what's going to happen to the investment account next year? Is it going to be removed or? You reverse the entry that you have put in, and then you continue on having this investment. And not only that, what do you do with that investment? You keep updating it. Then you go back to regular mode, as if you never uh, removed the investment. And you keep working with it, as if nothing happened, by continuing to debit and credit it. And what are the four types of debit credits for investment account transactions? You guys remember? I can, how, what would change an investment account? True. Income, exactly. John? Hmm? Dividends would change it, exactly. Yeah? I think you were going to say purchases and sales. <laughs> That's why I'm not a sidekick. Irvi? Anybody else? Amortization? And the last one that we know of? Selling, sales, exactly. Your favorite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You could buy assets, you could buy more. Your favorite. You guys already forgot? That's not really. What about the inventory stuff? Spend so much time on that last time. Inventory deferrals and reversal of deferrals. All that good mathematics with that. All right, guys. So that's the, sort of that's the idea. So I would say before you guys panic.
for the exam or before you start thinking about panicking, I would say study more of the fundamentals of what we just, you know, if you, like learn how to work with the investment account. What modifies the investment account? You know, who are these firms and what do they want? Why are they talking to each other? More on the conceptual level, why are we even doing this? Before you get into all of this, you start jumping into this, start jumping. You know, what is going on? Why are we doing it? Who is doing what? What is the role of the parent? What is the role of the subsidiary? Um, what is the goal of this report? Why are we publishing this report? Right? And then, then if you have that, I want you to go through the journal entry A, S, I, E, D, all these fun entries, exciting journal entries. And then you can go through them and find out what is it that they're doing, you know? So I wanted to take, guys, five minutes, a little sort of case study, and I want you guys really to work on this by yourself for a minute or two first and answer these questions. I'll read them off to you. Answer these questions by yourself in your notebook, and then I'll have somebody present it for the, you know, that participation, engagement part of the class. If you really want to get involved, um, now is the time, okay? So this is another opportunity for you guys. So please, uh, can you guys see these questions or is it not very visible? You can see it? You can see it? In the back you can see it also? Okay. Okay, good. So the, I'll just read it once. So just, guys, just about three, four questions. What is the purpose of consolidation entries? Whose books and records they affect? What is the purpose of these consolidation entries? What are we trying to achieve here? And now go through each one. S, I, E, D. List each entry out. And just in your own words, explain to me, what is the purpose of this entry? Just like what we just talked about now, I, you know, with, with A. Entry A, what is it doing? Entry S, why? Why, we do, why do we do entry S? What accounts does it hit? Why, why do we do it? What does it accomplish? Right? And then, how do these journal entries occur in consolidation with the solution and without the solution? You know, because I I questions that are going to be coming with the solution and how does this matrix occur then without the solution and how does this matrix occur then? So just sort of separate your page into two. Separate your page into two halves and say with the solution and without the solution and sort of answer everything double. Sort of like make it like one and two. Okay guys? So please, one, one minute, two minutes, work individually. Think of it as like a pop quiz, sort of see where you're at, you know, for like a self-assessment. So with the homework, with the homework, I think, you know, these questions in a way, um, they're all the same question, right? And they're all very specific. It's very specific. That's why I kind of wanted to zoom out this time and study something a little bit different because the homework here, the whole chapter in the book, in the homework is discussing this idea of goodwill. Um, but I think it's, a, the, it's better to see what's actually going on conceptually. So what I wanted to do is, I wanted to go over this for about 15 minutes, just to really highlight, you know, show you guys how to do some of the problems, see what you had to do, how you got it. And then I wanted to move on to the PowerPoint I made for chapter three. So with this question number 15, we have Bulling Inc. acquired 100% of the voting common stock of Vicar Inc. on January 1, 2013. The book value and the fair value of Vicar's accounts on that date are as follows. Assume that 12,000 shares of common stock with a par of 5 and a fair value of 47 were obtained 
for all Vikers outstanding common stock, how much goodwill should be recognized? So how do you know what assets minus liabilities are without knowing what the assets are? It's a big part of the equation there. Hmm? What, what's the, like, what's the sum of ones? It's just 880. So that's the part I was trying to have you do. Maybe it was just I didn't hear what you said. So 880 minus the 420, then you get how much do you get? What's the assets minus the liabilities? Yeah, exactly, exactly. There you go. And then 460 less the 564, you get the 104. So in a way, exactly right. Exactly right method, right numbers. Thank you so much, Andrew. Appreciate it. You know, you want to first see what are the, you know, and you're working with fair value, which right away you get to see what the fair value of the company is. And then you're subtracting the fair value of the liabilities and then applying the consideration to get the goodwill, right? You know, in a, in a way, is there any difference, guys, between fair value and book value here? Exactly. Exactly. In a way, guys, what Drew is saying is that, you know, you could examine the assets minus liabilities, um, assets minus liabilities on a book value level first, and then apply the consideration and see, oh, wow, I'm over the book value. But then assign each individual excess to assets or liabilities. And why would I want to do something like that? To figure out the excess, and more importantly, is, you know, it's going to affect you in the future. Also figure out what your amortization is. Because, you know, you have to do this in a way. Not only do you have to do that, you're also going to have to look at what is the um, useful life of all these assets and amortize all these differences, amortize them over the years of the useful life. So in a way, it's kind of a quick answer computationally here, but there's a little bit more going on. What are they acquiring? Carlos is saying they're acquiring 100% of the common stock, right? So in a way, in transactions, usually you don't acquire assets, you acquire the equity, right? Because, why? Because equity is a way of ownership in corporations, voting equity, right? There's voting equity and non-voting equity. Because you want to get the voting equity because you want control, right? You don't want equity with no control, you're trying to take something over. So you buy the equity, but having 100% of the equity gives you rights to what? the assets and don't forget the liabilities unfortunately too so the idea is but the, but the right but the idea is at the because think about it so what's going to happen is that you're going to record an investment into and the investment into is going to be I want to just look at the exact entry. Because I think the goodwill does get recorded. Even though we're, we're, we're creating like a purchase. Like, yeah. So the fair value and then the, the 70,000. Yeah, you know what? I think what's going on here is that the 70 will be recorded as part of the goodwill entry at year end. So w the question is asking how much goodwill should be recognized? In this acquisition transaction, how much should good, so much goodwill should be? So w yeah, it's a good, very good question. 
It's a good question because a lot of these, you know, in terms of the way I test, you know, my tests are not designed to maliciously trick you. It's just to test your knowledge. But the CPA is designed to maliciously trick you, which is the way they do it, um, to make it more competitive. And that's exactly how they do it. So I've been looking at some of those questions. They want you to be involved in this day this, day that, like Carlos was saying. They want you to get a story about a certain date and then move you in the, in the wrong direction that way to get you out of the past zone. So the idea is here, like, when we say goodwill, we do goodwill, goodwill on, at, the end of the, at the end of the year. But when they say, in this transaction, they're talking more about literally in this transaction, not on the books and records level. They're talking about more like in the transaction as a whole was their goodwill. You have to look at the intention of what the question is trying to test. It's not trying to test the timing of the, trans of the journal entry. It's trying to test more the concept overall. And I think that's a good distinction for you guys, test takers, to have. What are they, what's the intention? Very good. So in a way, in a way, all these questions are, are basically testing you a similar thing. So for example, I think the method of solving these questions in a way, most of it is about, okay, what is the consideration being provided? Like what is the cash piece? What's the, what's the debt piece? Well, how much are they giving to you? And then you apply that against the fair value of the assets. And then you get the goodwill. I think sort of that's, I'll post the solutions. I think it will be easy for you to see that that's what, what, what is going on here. What's the consideration? You know, it's good to know the nature of the consideration, if it's cash, debt, or equity, uh, one or the other, or all three. What's the fair value? What are you getting for it? What's the excess? That's the goodwill. I think, I think this is not the complicated part. I think the complicated part is sort of, understanding, and, uh, and I want to start moving to this now, is understanding more about how we consolidate the books of two companies. This is sort of an important one. So in this one, was anybody, does anybody want to help with this? Or this was kind of tricky, no? This was tricky. It was like, yeah, uh, Drew, do you want to sort of walk me through it? I'm going to draw it out here. Yeah. So, so Blue Town. So Blue Town goes and acquires Chapel Hill. Right? So Blue Town. So Blue Town issued these shares and acquired Town Hill. So the idea is, how much was the consideration given? Right. So how do you know the consolidated net assets? In a way, in a way, you want to look at Blue Town's equity before the acquisition. So Blue Town had common stock of, yeah, seven hundred. And 980, 1680. Right, and add the newly issued stock, which was 30, 34 times 35. And what's 34 times 35? 1 million 190,000. Two million eight seventy. 
yeah. That's in a way, guys, is a little bit kind of looking at capital structure, capital structure sort of understanding of what what is net assets? What is it that comprises net assets in general, right? So in a way, to me, net assets, okay, so we have a certain amount of equity. That's my net assets. Now I've purchased the company. For how much? For one one million six eighty. Okay, so that's also net assets because I just issued it and I got the same value. So that's also net assets. So in a way, it's my equity plus whatever equity I had just acquired for whatever price I had just paid kind of just working more with the capital structure, understanding capital structure is sort of, you know, take about five, ten minutes, guys, to introduce chapter three. And I just want to go over just like a, you know, in an overview of what's going on in the class, because I think we are getting to that point where the midterm is coming up. Um, we have chapter three this week. Basically, chapter three is on Thursday. And chapter three homework is due on Monday. And then next week, we're going to go over mostly chapter four. Three, and then four will start again on Thursday. And then the week following that is going to be review. Like I'll have enough time to do a review for one class. And then on the seventh, we'll have a midterm on chapters one through four. Or midterm for chapters one through four. So in a way, guys, um, what I wanted to introduce to you guys today, in the next couple minutes, is the Thursday lecture. The Thursday lecture is going to be primarily just chapter three. And I was just trying to bring it up, but the idea is with your packet, with your packet, this here, There is a really good part of chapter 3 that goes over this. If you start looking, for example, on page 91 and 93 of the packet, you can really see 97. You can really see what we're talking about in terms of the process of the elimination entries. Yeah, yeah I can give you guys one, yeah. So this is, this is what I want you guys to sort of be reading in, in the book. This is what I want you guys to be reading in the book and understanding sort of the example of how this works visually. Because we're getting deeper into this material where now, where now we're going to start going over different types of consolidation methods. Okay, and I'm just going to take a few minutes to go over this, about five minutes, to just introduce this. This is up on Blackboard. It's a slide deck I did the other day for you guys to sort of summarize what I think is important out of Chapter 3. I think on Thursday, the lecture, I used all the slides. This is like sort of a, a quick summary. So Chapter 3, in a way, discusses three different methods of keeping track of the investment account on the parents' books and records. Now, there's three different methods that are allowed by GAAP, and the reason we're using three different methods is because they all have varying complexity and varying benefits. So when we use the equity method to keep track of consolidation after acquisition, by the way, this is all consolidation after acquisition. Um, and for years, this goes on, right? For the equity method, we already know. We just sort of talked about it. Like, you know, you, you keep hitting everything, and, and you know, inventory, amortization, purchases, sales, uh, equity and earnings, investing, dividends, anything that impacts the investment account, we record, we cancel out, and the next year, we continue the process, and we just keep doing it. There's a sort of a, a case study here of a three-year run with this. So also highly recommended if you have insomnia, that one specifically. If three-year consolidation will knock you out right, right away. 
So the idea is, what about the initial value method? So we're moving on. We're moving on to a different method. We have the initial value method and the partial equity method. The initial value method, instead of hitting the investment with every single type of transaction, we actually keep it at the initial value. Why is it attractive? Because of the ease of application. Because we're not this one, we're changing this, we're ch modifying that, and we're modifying this, and it's like constantly, constantly worrying. Instead, we bought the thing for 800, it stays at 800. Done. What's the disadvantage? It's not fair value, or it doesn't approximate, it doesn't approximate our true performance of the investment. If I bought Geico from Berkshire Hathaway, I bought Geico for 10, 10 years ago for $2 billion, and that's how I keep it on my book. Is this thing still worth $2 billion? Yeah. So when you look, when they look on their books, they're going to be like, say, they're in an internal meeting, and they're like, so Geico, $2 billion, huh? They're like, no, nah, don't worry about it. That's BS. We don't look at that number. Meaningless. Oh, why? Oh, we haven't changed it in 10 years. Geico has quadrupled since then. Don't like, mean it, right? Loses relevancy. So isn't that always the case in accounting where we have relevancy versus complexity? Relevancy, I always re remember that in hedge fund accounting, when I always worked in hedge fund accounting, that was always the debate. Relevancy versus complexity. When we're trying to value derivatives like uh, weather, weather swaps and all sorts of exotic things, we're like, how much modeling do we do for this? Or do we just like go and find the price and somebody tells them, okay, fine. Or do we sit there and we model and we create an internal model and we verify the assumptions and we get Bloomberg and we, yeah. It's always how much does it cost us to actually maintain this thing versus is the number accurate enough for the investment community to digest it without suing us. <laughs> so that's basically the, the debate, usually, in terms of the li liability versus how much is it going to cost, right? And, of course, in Big Four, it's a debate that is constantly going on because they do have the money to do a lot of really cool things, and they also are very resistant to using their resources because they're very cost-conscious accountants. So what about the partial equity method? Partial equity method is a way of recording the investment account, but you just, you just use the equity and earnings of investee and dividends. So in other words, what don't you use? What don't you hit? Inventory, right? So you don't have to worry about all that creative mathematics that we did last time. And? Amortization. So basically, inventory and amortizations are not included. So in a way, partial equity wouldn't it be kind of, well, I don't know if it's preferred, but like makes sense you know, to me. Because you know, you still have a relevant investment value, but you're not sitting there and how much did I buy this patent for 10 years ago? And that was excess by this dollars. And now I'm in the ninth year, and I'm still amortizing that piece. And who knows if it's still relevant. So you're not doing, you're sort of giving that up. You're letting that go, right? So it's still relevant, and the complexity of the method is substantially reduced. So when you look at this in a way, in chapter three, the goal is to run for, to, to understand what's going on with this company for three years, kind of using each method. Well, what is the nature of the consolidation using each method? And, and you know, and that sort of, by looking at it that way, it starts really revealing the, the you know, the each journal entry, S, I, E, D, A, and what is their purpose? You know, some you may not even use anymore because you're not dealing with dividends anymore. Some, you know, you're not dealing with expenses anymore. You don't even need that. You know, but S and A, it seems like you do still need because you have to eliminate at least the investment account. 
So all these questions that we, that we asked you before are coming out here now because you have to distinguish between the three methods of elimination. So you're going to want to know, why am I not eliminating this one? Why am I eliminating this one in the equity but not in the partial equity? You know, and, and that's why I wanted to go over the accounts and sort of go through, go through the transaction of identifying each balance first, right? And then, and then I want to go over this more on Thursday, but this is sort of, if you can look over the slides and the packet in the meantime, I think it will help you to study for Thursday's lecture because it's going to be more technical. It's better sort of come and prepare your questions, you know, prepare a couple questions for class, prepare a couple questions for your group. And I wanted to sort of, guys, I wanted to also, um, before we go, an announcement. In regards to, in regards to tutoring, in regards to tutoring, a student came by my office, we had a really good discussion about an idea. Because I know the next two weeks is really good study time, review time, um, better than the third week, because I'm a big believer in that you can't really do a lot in the last couple of days. It's the auditor mentality. You prepare in advance. But what do I want you guys to do? Please, send an email to your group. See, see me. If you create a tutoring session, I will be there. If you want to create a study group and say, I want to review for the exam, let me know when and where, and I will coordinate my schedule around that, even if it's not Friday morning. If it's Friday morning and you're doing your tutoring session then, let's do it in my office. Come by my office and we can, we can work through the problems together. I just want to make sure that you bring your team along and I want you guys to work together, you know, and we can work more efficiently that way. Because some of the issues you can help each other with, I want to help you with the complex issues on top of that. 